I'm really grateful to be here. I enjoyed the time when the Lewis Institute was here two years ago and Lyle Dorset, one of my closest friends in the world, was with us. And many of you, I'm sure, remember that time. Um, I was excited, too, when Joel gave me the topic, sharing the gospel C.S. Lewis style. So the fact that Lewis valued evangelism as one of the spiritual disciplines is clear from his writing. Um, we can cite all kinds of examples, and some of these uh, uh, comments I'll bring up in other, other messages that we have together. But he wrote in God in the Dock, most of my books are evangelistic. He said it is our duty to do all we can to convert unbelievers in some of his letters. He wrote in God in the Dock in another essay, to convert one's adult neighbor and one's adolescent neighbor just free from school is the practical thing. He also said in Meditations on the Third Commandment, he who converts his neighbor has performed the most practical Christian political act of all. I see Christians a lot of times belly aching about politics, right or left, it makes no difference, when they could be busy transforming people's lives by sharing the gospel. Lewis didn't miss that particular fact that that was necessary. As he founded the Oxford Socratic Club, he wrote this, Christianity is not merely what a man does with his solitude, it is not even what God does with his solitude. It tells of God descending into the coarse publicity of history, and there enacting what can and must be talked about. And then he said to a gathering of seminarians, uh, he was very direct when he said, Woe to you if you do not evangelize. He also said the Christian knows from the outset that the salvation of a single soul is more important than the production or preservation of all the epics and tragedies in the world. So for Lewis, this was very, very important value. But furthermore, what's interesting is that he did not feel he was gifted at this. He held it as a high value. So sometimes I go to churches and pastors will say, oh yeah, we really like to encourage the people with the gift of evangelism to do it. And I say, man, I want to come speak at your church. Is this bad? Thanks. I want to come speak at your church so I can tell the people that don't have the gift of giving, they don't have to give anymore. <laughs> and I don't want to go to the church where only those with the gift of mercy are merciful. That'd be a cold-hearted place. But Lewis recognized this was something that God has called us to do, and though he did not feel gifted and sometimes felt awkward, the fact that he practiced sharing his faith showed that the mission of the church was important to him. And look at the wide-ranging ways in which he did it. It was very much integrated throughout his life. He shared one-on-one. -on -one. There were students of his that he had a hand in leading to Christ. Dom Beatty Griffiths would be one. George Sayre would be another one. Sheldon von Alken would be another one. So we know that he did this one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the Oxford Socratic Club, which was a gathering of people that would come together during term at Oxford University one night a week. You'd have a non-Christian read a paper, the and the Christians would respond. The next week, a Christian would read a paper, and the non-Christians would respond. It was a way to reach out to the Oxford University community. My doctoral supervisor was Basil Mitchell, who was the vice president of the Socratic Club. And then he became the president when Lewis went to Cambridge. But he talked about how Lewis was very, very formidable in, in his approach to these things, and also that it was a matter of deep concern for him. Um, he was also willing to participate in the BBC radio broadcast that would later, of course, become Mere Christianity. But he had his books, too, that he used to share the gospel. Those that were explicitly evangelistic, the apologetic books, um, you've got Mere Christianity. Um, I, don't, I don't see Marianne Femister here. She might be here later in the week, but she put together a book, Mere Christians, about people who came to faith through the reading of Mere Christianity. And then um, this is a very interesting story a lot of people don't know. Um, when Doug Gresham first came to the Wade Center, the first time I met him, C.S. Lewis' stepson, he, he came to visit the Wade and I don't think he was a Christian at that time. Maybe Marge could tell him. He's a robust faith now and shares his faith in Jesus with others. We had him here last spring to talk about C.S. Lewis and evangelism. But um, Marge gave to Doug on tape mere Christianity. And Doug took it home to his wife, Mary. Mary wasn't really interested in spiritual things, but she was doing some gardening one day and she thought she had listened to some tapes while she was gardening, and so she plugged in those tapes. 
And she came to faith listening to mere Christianity because Marge gave them to Doug, who gave them to Mary. The thing that's interesting is here, Lewis wrote the book. It's like cast your bread on the water. Little did he know that there'd be a place called the Wade Center and that those things would be passed on through Marge. Mary would get them and his daughter-in-law would come to faith through that effort. It's amazing. But also, it wasn't just his explicitly evangelistic books and his apologetic books, but his implicitly evangelistic books. His science fiction. I've discovered that any amount of theology can now be smuggled into people's minds under the guise of romance. He wrote that after he wrote Out of the Silent Planet. He said, most of my books are evangelistic. He wrote that we don't need more books on Christianity. We need more books by Christians on other topics with their Christianity latent. So they could see the integration of faith in the whole learning process. We'll talk about that in our third time together. There was also his preaching to the Oxford University students. Those of you who have read The Weight of Glory or The De Futilitate in Christian Reflections or On Learning in Wartime. They were all sermons he preached to the Oxford community. And then, of course, at churches. Um, When I first moved to Wheaton, I was the college pastor at College Church across the street. I was the first college pastor in the history of this town, which was nice because everything you did looked innovative and nobody (laughs) compared you with anybody else. But the guy who was the chairman of the board at that time was a guy named Paul Ogren, and he had been in the American military in World War II in London, and he came to faith under the preaching of William Sangster. So he gave me a copy of the biography of William Sangster, written by his son, Paul. And he said, you should read this book. I came to faith under this guy's ministry. I'm reading the book. And all of a sudden, as I'm reading along, after the war was over, they had a Christ is a Victory campaign at Westminster Central Hall, the main Methodist church in in England. And one of the main speakers each night was C.S. Lewis. And he would preach. And he would do sometimes apologetic work, and then they'd have the preacher get up. And the guy that would do the preaching sometimes was a guy named Stephen Olford. Stephen Olford lived in Wheaton at the time I read this book. He preached my ordination sermon. I go to Stephen Olford, and I say, tell me about this. You preached with Lewis? He said, oh, yeah. He was scintillating in debate. But he preached like an English grocer. I don't know what he meant by that. (laughs) I don't know exactly what he meant by that. But the thing was, if you read Lewis's essay on Christian apologetics in God in the Dock, he said, I have often seen it where you get your academic up there to sort of clear the way of the obstacles of the arguments of the skeptics and then get the preacher up there to preach to conversion. And Lewis actually did this sort of thing. And I talked with somebody who was there to hear it and participate in it. And then also he would preach to the RAF airmen. Lewis was deeply concerned that these airmen were dying as they were, as they were fighting in the battle for Britain, and he felt compelled to go. He didn't feel comfortable doing it, but he felt it was necessary. And he would preach the RAF airmen. Um, and then, of course, there were times when he would be engaged in what was called one-man brains trusts, where he would go to factories and answer questions of the people if they had questions about faith. These were things that he would do because evangelism mattered to him. And then, of course, his letters. You could look at Paul Ford's book, Yours, Jack, where he pulled out of all the letters that Lewis has written, called out those on spiritual direction. Lewis felt a pastoral responsibility to write to everybody who wrote to him. And here are these letters that are just mainly about spiritual direction. And you can't believe the number of times he's sharing his faith. And there was a woman named uh, Mary Nyland, who we know came to faith through letters from C.S. Lewis. All this to say, given the breadth of Lewis's practice of ministering the gospel to others, we could take this theme, communicating the gospel Lewis style, in a host of ways. So I just have to ask you with the limited amount of time that you'll trust me to pick a few flowers from this garden to present to you as we're together. Also, I'll seek to embellish Lewis by means of various applications that build on his ideas, and hopefully I can talk with you about how maybe I've been able to share Christ with people by using some of Lewis's concepts, and hopefully this will encourage you. I'm deeply moved by the fact that if you apply some of the things that we talk about during this week, there will be people in heaven forever because of what you do. This moves me.
So our outline for the week, as far as my presentations are concerned, communicating the gospel convincingly, part one and two. First, I want to talk about the character of the evangelist and authenticity in the evangelist's life. And second, communicating the gospel convincingly, part two, the character of the evangelist and the love of God. We have to have an intrinsic motivation. We do not present the gospel because the church needs to swell its roles or to produce more giving units in the church. No, we present the gospel because people need to know they are deeply loved by God. And there's a thing called forgiveness, and that God's willing to enter our lives as Lord and help bring order out of the chaos we've made of things in our life. Thirdly, communicating the gospel creatively. By all means, the convincing nature of an integrated faith. And then fourthly, communicating the gospel creatively, part two, getting past watchful dragons, the use of story in evangelism. Fourthly, communic- uh, fifthly, communicating the gospel conclusively, part one, I want to look at some apologetic issues. And then communicating the gospel convincingly, part two, the apologist addresses more big questions. We'll, we'll take two sections on apologetics. But before we begin, I want to pray another time. Let's pray. Father, it is absolutely ridiculous for us to believe one person could stand up in a room full of people and communicate in a way that every person would feel that something in their life was touched or somehow there was something given that spoke to the specific circumstances of the challenges that they face day to day. But we know, Father, that if you're involved in the transaction, great things can happen. We know, Father, that once Andrew brought to your son five loaves and two fish, it was nothing for the need of 5,000 people who were hungry. But your son took those loaves and fish and broke them, and everybody left satisfied. I pray that your Holy Spirit would take the crumbs I offer in these six sessions and that he would apply it to the heart of each person here so that each person would leave here each time we meet together feeling satisfied. That something was said that spoke to their heart in the context of their circumstances that was meaningful, opened their eyes to a sense of purpose and service, for Christ and his kingdom. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. So our first time together, I want to talk about communicating the gospel convincingly, the character of the, abo- uh, of the evangelist. In the abolition of man, C.S. Lewis wrote, for the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality. And the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline, and virtue. Basically, if we look at our lives uh, and we compare it to the plumb line of reality, we've got major scoliosis. We've got scoliosis of our reason. We've got scoliosis of our will. We've got scoliosis of our emotional life. How do we conform our lives to the plumb line of reality? I remember the last time John Stott spoke at Wheaton College. It was years ago. Uh, Edmund Chapel was packed He only spoke for 10 minutes, but they had microphones set up all over the chapel, and he invited students to ask questions. And I remember one one, uh, student asked, how do you reach a postmodernist for Jesus? Now, I need to take an aside here, because um, I've talked with a lot of people about postmodernism. I talked with a professor one time. I said, tell me what you hope for your students. He said, I want to prepare them to live in a postmodern world. I said, okay, you're preparing them then for irrelevancy. Usually in a lifetime, we're going to see two or three major uh, challenges come through the pike. And um, C.S. Lewis said, the more up-to-date a book is, the sooner it's out of date. (laughs) You want to get them to learn how to think well so they can stand up to any challenge that might come through. So anyway, I, 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 this, there's also the idea, too, about the student who is, um, cause, cause, because more people, I think, talk about postmodernism than actually read about it. The student was asked one time, you know, uh, have you ever read War and Peace? And he said, no, but I wrote a book report on that once. So it's kind of like that. 
But if you want to read a good book, read Terry Eagleton's After Theory, where he basically sounds a death knell to uh, postmodernism and so on. It was a time when it was still relevant. Stott was asked, how do you reach a postmodernist for Jesus? And Stott gave a tight definition of postmodernism. It was like the tip of the iceberg that showed that it was informed by lots of reading. Gave a tight definition of deconstruction. And then he said the best way to reach, the, reach a postmodernist for Jesus is by being an authentic person. Well, as soon as he said that, I took a step back several generations and I fell into existential despair because I am not an authentic person. I believe in the high ideal of love, but I've had sharp words of people I say I love most in the world. I believe in justice, but there have been times I've been unfair in my treatment of others. And I remember shuffling out of Edmund Chapel that morning thinking, I don't think I'm going to be reaching many postmodernists for Jesus. By the time I got to the narthex of Edmund Chapel, it dawned on me, you know what, I think there's probably only been one person who ever lived and walked on this earth who could say, you know what, I did it the way it's supposed to be done. I think only Jesus has been the perfectly authentic person. So then the question changes a bit, doesn't it? How does an inauthentic person begin to approximate authenticity. And I think it's by being honest about our inauthenticity. And, and I, I think that this is, this is helpful to us to keep in mind. If we want to be convincing in our presentation of the gospel, something of the character of the evangelist needs to be informed by his or her own deficiency. Lewis is too honest to let his readers forget there's something incredibly broken in each of us and in need of desperate repair. And this awareness is not to make us morose, it's to drive us to Christ. We had in our community recently an eminently known pastor. Ooh, there was some moral sadness. And I had students at Wheaton when this occurred said, why do we go on then when these things happen? And I said, I, I, I didn't need this to occur to show me that people can stumble. I, I had Moses. You know, he was a hothead and a murderer. His temper was still bothering him, even when he was leading the children of Israel in the wilderness. He wasn't allowed to go in the promised land. I had David, the adulterer and a murderer. I had Naomi. She struggled with bitterness. I had Paul. He was a Christian killer and kind of hard to work with. <laughs> And as I thought about these things, I thought, you know what? If, if somebody falls, I don't want to turn from God when that happens. I want to run to God because I recognize my own need in those moments. And Lewis won't let us forget. Furthermore, we become aware of our need for God's grace and that it's not casual, it's constant. And this awareness lends authenticity and vitality to our evangelism. We don't forget our own need. And we minister to others with that awareness. Lewis does this. Lewis's writing is filled with examples of his self-awareness. In a letter to Arthur Greaves dated September 12, 1933, he's only been a Christian barely two years. It was one of his first written extant works in theodicy, by the way, for those of you that like study of problem of evil. He concludes the letter reflecting back on his pre-converted past. He says he was overwhelmed by his pride, and he was ashamed of it. He was overwhelmed by his short temper and his hatred of people he disagreed with. This doesn't sound like the Lewis we know, the mature Lewis. But the mature Lewis grew because he was aware of these things in his life. He was discontent with this part of himself and his longing to get better. I think that should always be at the core of some of our evangelistic effort, that honesty that leads to character. Uh, you look at a preface to the Screw Tape Letters in the second edition. Those letters came out. They were, they were uh, published in The Guardian in, in London. He was paid two pounds per letter. Finally, they're put under common cover, and they sold out what marks the first print in a couple weeks. I don't know how many of that first year uh, printings it went through, but it was probably about 20. And then finally, he does the second edition, uh, and he wrote the preface to the second edition. And he has this comment in there. 
He said, some have paid me the undeserved compliment of supposing my letters were the right ripe fruit of many years' study in moral theology. They forget there's an equally reliable, though far less creditable way to know how wickedness works. My heart, I needeth no other, showeth me the way of the ungodly. Lewis's self-awareness, I think, is, is a key to understanding his interest in sharing the gospel with others. Another example would be uh, something similar that's seen in The Great Divorce. How many of you have read The Great Divorce? Virtually all of you, but for the few of you that don't know this story, it's basically a satirical retelling of Dante's divine comedy, at least it borrows from Dante in form. Lewis finds himself in hell. Eventually, his Virgil will be George MacDonald on the threshold of heaven. But he finds himself in hell, and, and like any good Brit, he sees a queue, and a fight breaks out, and so he decides to get in the queue, right? Because he's two steps up already. A bus comes, he gets on the bus, and the bus takes him up to the threshold of heaven. But on the tour, he's sitting next to somebody, and this guy is telling his story, and you get the picture, this guy is despicable. A fight breaks out on the bus. The next thing you know, after the jumble, Lewis is sitting next to somebody else. He tells us this, his story, and he's despicable. A fight breaks out again, and he's next to somebody else, and this happens multiple numbers of times. Finally, they get to the very threshold of heaven, and the light of heaven comes streaming in the windows of the bus. And at that moment, Lewis looks right down the aisle of the bus and sees his own visage in the mirror in the front of the bus. He's one of them. Lewis doesn't share the gospel condescendingly as if everybody else needs us. He shares it knowingly because he sees why he needs it and therefore shares it with vitality. Who can forget the comment in letters to an American lady when he writes to the lady and says, we are all very difficult to live with. It's good for us to remember that. And then, of course, Lewis's essay in Christian Apologetics, We Must Awaken in People an Awareness of Sin. He says the best way to do it is not to point theirs out. But begin with your own struggles this past week. It was Frederick Buechner who said, Before the gospel can be good news, it's got to be bad news. But how do you awaken a sense of sin? Unless you have a certain level of honesty and authenticity in your own life. In Mere Christianity, Lewis wrote, No man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. <laughs> he wrote, Also, the main thing we learn from a serious attempt to practice the Christian virtues is that we fail. If there was any idea that God had set us a sort of exam and that we might get good marks by deserving them, that has to be wiped out, Lewis said. And consequently, then, the self-awareness, which also may be a kind of gift of God, drives us to Christ. It was Spurgeon, I think, who said, I've learned to kiss the wave that slaps me against the rock of ages. And again, it makes our message authentic and vital. It also removes pretense from our presentation of the gospel. We don't have to put on airs. We're people who come to Jesus desperately. And we look to the people who are discovering that desperation in their own life, and we speak to them with authority out of our brokenness and out of our discovery of God's grace to meet us in those places. Furthermore, sharing the gospel will hopefully, I think, refine our character. And avoiding the mission of the church can dull our character at some level. Let me see if I can spell this out, picking up on Lewis's lead. In Philemon 6, in the NIV 1984, which in all the English translations, as I translate the Greek of that passage myself, I think that's the best translation of that text. And it says this, I pray that you'll be active in sharing your faith so that you'll have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ Jesus. This is meaningful to me. How will we have a full understanding? The Greek word there for full understanding is epigonosko. It's the most intimate word for uh, knowledge in the New Testament. How will, how will we have a fuller, more intimate relationship with God if we share the gospel? Let me see if I can contextualize it. I, I didn't become a Christian until I was a freshman in college. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, and we went to a church. It was a, a, 
a church where I, I never really heard the gospel there. I'm not saying it wasn't preached, but I didn't hear it. I was told if I went to a movie and Jesus came back, he wouldn't go in the theater to get me. I'd just go to hell forever. And I desperately wanted to see Walt Disney's The Shaggy Dog, but I didn't, know if, I, didn't, I didn't know if it was worth risking my eternal destiny to go see. And when Mrs. Greenlee, our neighbor down the street, came with her boys, Mike and Fred, and asked my mom if my brothers and I could go see The Shaggy Dog with her boys, I had great ambivalence. I'm looking at her at one end, eager to see it, and on the other hand, I'm scared stiff. And when my mother said it was okay for us to go see it, I began to wonder if she really loved me. <laughs> that she had put my life in such eternal peril. I was told in a Sunday school class if I lived a holy and righteous life all my life, but had one bad thought the last second of my life, I'd go straight to hell. My life was miserable. And I was always in trouble, so I just thought I was going to hell. At least I had this little window of opportunity before all hell broke loose. And I started living a pretty wild life, and all I discovered was that I was hurting other people and hurting myself and hurting people who cared for me. I went to college just so sad. My older brother was a Christian. He took me to a meeting. I heard the gospel. The first time I heard the gospel clearly, I responded to it like a duck to water. I was so excited to hear the God of the universe loved me and forgave me. And that, he, and that he wanted to enter into my life to bring order out of the chaos I'd made of things. I just thought, everybody's going to want to hear about this. And I just started sharing Christ with people. I played football. You have to take it completely by faith now, but I played football when I was in college. And I made it my goal to share Christ with every guy I played football with every year I was in college. And we saw about 15 guys a season come to faith, about 60 guys maybe over the time I was in college. But you know what I discovered as I was sharing my faith? The guys I shared with, they had all these questions, questions I had never thought of asking. I am utterly embarrassed to tell you before I was a Christian, I never once thought of God's good and all-powerful. Why does evil exist in the universe? I've since written a book on that topic. It, it intrigues me. But I never heard it till I was sharing my faith. And when my friend said, what about this? I said, that's a really good question. I have no clue. But you know what? I won't leave a stone unturned until I can find out some substantive answer. You know, at least a skeletal structure of an answer that you could flesh out later. And, and, and the thing is, I learned, one, not to be afraid of questions. C.S. Lewis said, if our religion is objective, we must never avert our eyes from those elements in it which seem puzzling or repellent. For it's precisely in the puzzling or repellent where we discover what we do not yet know and need to know. I learned not to be afraid of questions. I, I, I also learned not to be afraid of doubts. If you don't have any doubts about your faith, you're delusional. You think you've achieved omniscience. It's okay to have these doubts. Don't run from them, run towards them. And begin to discover what God might have for you in those particular places. I picked that up from Lewis, but as I was entering into these discussions with people about the gospel, and they asked the hard questions. I also, looking for answers, came across Lewis's name in a lot of the literature, but I never really started reading Lewis until my sister here, Kathy, told me about Lewis years ago. I said, wow. It's interesting I started reading Lewis. I started to grow, sharing my faith. But something else happened, another way we grow. And this relates to Lewis's idea of this awareness of our deficiency of character and our longing to grow and get better. I started sharing my faith. Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. If you're not examining your life, I guarantee you other people will be happy to do it for you. <laughs> and, and, and I remember um, um, praying one time a year after I'd become a Christian, Lord, discipline me. Lord, discipline me. I've never prayed that prayer since. <laughs> the next three months seemed like everybody I knew felt it was their duty to come up and share with me deficiencies in my life. Some of those guys on the football team, some of those guys in my fraternity said, you call yourself a Christian, but this stuff is incongruous with the things you're talking about. And I realized I needed to go deeper in these places. 
I could have said, well, if my life doesn't match up, I'll just stop sharing Jesus. I knew a man once who told me, I'd never put a Christian bumper sticker on my car. If I did that, I'd have to drive better. (laughs) You share your faith, and consequently, people are going to want to know, is it real in your life? Is it the real deal? And you start sharing your faith, and you start discovering Jesus meeting you in places of deep brokenness, places where all of a sudden, you're starting to see um, the things that need to change inside of your life. Um, I I, I think, too, where I mentioned um, if you don't examine your life, other people feel like they need to um, examine it for you. Those guys that pointed these things out to me, I was able to see some of them come to Christ three years later because they saw I took their word seriously. I learned from what they had to say, and I tried to go deeper in my relationship, and they saw that I was serious about it. I think this is important. Um, And you also discover, as you share your faith, in light of this, the scrutiny, they may not just be scrutinizing your life, they may be scrutinizing the Christian culture. You share your faith, and you'll discover people who have been hurt by Christians. They don't want anything to do with Christianity. I think sharing our faith makes us mindful of how we might appear to the world. Now, I don't want you to beat yourself up fully. Sometimes we appear badly to the world because some people hate Christians because they choose to live an anti-Christian lifestyle. That also occurs. But nevertheless, if you meet somebody who doesn't want anything to do with Jesus because they've been hurt by the incongruities, one, let that be a lesson to you to keep trying to grow deeper in your faith. But also, it gives you an opportunity for the person who's been burned to stand as a surrogate before them. And say, you know the story you just told me about how you were hurt by Christians? It breaks my heart. I'm a Christian. Will you let me stand as a surrogate in the place of that person who hurt you and ask for forgiveness? Because I wouldn't want anything to keep you from seeing how deeply you are loved by God. And also, I think it challenges us further to grow in Christ. Now, Dallas Willard once observed that the gospel is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to earning. That's important. Let me say it again. The gospel is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to earning. We should be seeking to grow in Christ. We shouldn't be inert in our Christian life. After presenting the gospel in mere Christianity, Lewis directs his reader's attention to spiritual formation, to the development of character. Again, he says, you cannot make men good by law, and without good men, you cannot have a good society. There has to be some transformative power of the gospel in our life operational, which gives us confidence when we present the power of Christ to change us, to change people. The gospel should be transformative. So Lewis writes in Mere Christianity in this regard about the cardinal virtues in Book 3, Part 2. These are written about in Plato, uh, particularly the Cratylus. They're written about in Aristotle, particularly the Nicomachean Ethics. The early church fathers, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, the medieval mystics. As Lewis addresses the character of the Christian and the evangelist, he is sitting on the shoulders of giants. But also, if you read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, you'll see virtually all the, all the characteristics of, of virtue, courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom, written about in that text. And Peter writes about it in the context of becoming better evangelists, because if these qualities are ours and increasing, he says, they will render us neither useless nor unfruitful, i.e., they will make us useful and fruitful in the presentation of the gospel. So let's look at those briefly. Number one is the area of courage. I want to define each of these characteristics. It's good for us to know. Um, uh, We could also use this in follow-up with people that we've led to Christ. But courage is the first characteristic of virtue. Virtue is an integrated whole made up of courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom. All of these characteristics are habits. One courageous act doesn't make you a courageous person. It's a lifetime of learning to endure to have fortitude, to persevere. So courage is a habitual ability to suffer pain and hardship. It's endurance. It's fortitude. It's staying power. Courage is a habitual ability to suffer pain and hardship. It's endurance. 
It's fortitude. It's staying power. Courage is the ability to say yes to right action, even in the teeth of pain. Lewis writes, Fortitude includes two kinds of courage, the kind that faces danger as well as the kind that sticks with it, under pain. Guts is perhaps the nearest to modern English. Courage is the ability as evangelists, even if the tide seems to be going against the grain of the Christian community, that we still stay missionally engaged. Um, let me see if I give you an example, though, of uh, courage as something that's more related to endurance. I remember when I was in college, um, I, I was playing football. Football is, a, is an anaerobic sport. You put out for six seconds and you pant desperately for air for 30 till the next play. A real good friend of mine who was following me up as a new Christian, his name was Pokey Cleek. He was a conference champion in the high hurdles, but he ran cross country to build up his endurance during the off season. And when the, my freshman football season was over, he came to me and said, Jerry, I'm going to go run in the Palos Verdes Marathon, which has since blended into the Los Angeles Marathon. But when it was the Palos Verdes Marathon, if any of you know Southern California, Palos Verdes is like this. It's not the, it's not the Chicago Marathon that's flat as a pancake. Um, by the way, Lewis was injured in World War I in a place called Mont Bernicon. I was reading a biographical sketch of Lewis in one of the books about him. It says, Lewis was wounded taking a mountain in France. I've been to Mount Bernicon. It's about as mountainous as Mount Prospect, Illinois. I mean, it's as flat as a pancake. But anyway, <laughs> Pokey comes to me and says, I want you to run with me in the Palos Verdes Marathon. I hadn't trained a day for the marathon. He had been running cross country all, all fall. I said, Pokey, I can't do this. I'm a freshman, right? We're very gullible. We could be taken in. I think he was the one that told me, did you know the word gullible isn't in the dictionary? <laughs> really? I didn't know that. <laughs> so Pokey says, I'm sure, Jerry, you'll be a natural. Why don't you go? We had to get up at 5.30 in the morning to drive to Palos Verdes. We get there, and I, I'm saying to myself, what am I doing here? And then all of a sudden, I see the ABC Wide World of Sports camera crew there. And then I see the LA Times photographer there. And all of a sudden, that adrenaline started pumping. And I was convinced I was going to win this thing. You know what? <laughs> Sometimes that stuff happens. I was just a freshman. I'm embarrassed as all get out that when the thing got ready to start and the guy was going to blow off the gun, I was in a sprinter stance on the front row. He shoots the gun off, and I take off. And you know what, people? I did. I led the Palos Verdes Marathon. <laughs> for about 200 yards. <laughs> I had a stitch in my side, knew I had another 26 miles, 185 more yards to go. I never finished it. I got 20 miles in about three and a half hours, and I lost all the skin on my feet. I couldn't walk straight for three days. It was really unfortunate because I was trying to kill my friend Pokey Cleek, but I couldn't catch him. <laughs> you know what I learned that day? A marathon isn't a sprint. Not, neither is life a sprint. It requires endurance, fortitude, staying power. It requires, um, and, and the Christian life is this way as well. Jesus said, go. Most are not naturally gifted, but the courageous persevere and learn from their mistakes and grow. I don't have the gift of evangelism. I have it as a high value. I have made a boatload of mistakes. But I've tried to learn from the mistakes and ask forgiveness of the people I might have offended but also learn from each encounter so that when new encounters come, we learn how to do it better next time. I think Lewis was a great evangelist because just as I recounted all the places where he was sharing his faith in his life, he was growing and learning from each of those encounters. Now, the next area is temperance. Temperance is a habitual ability to resist the enticement of immediate pleasure in order to gain the greater though more remote good. Temperance is a habitual ability to resist the enticement of immediate pleasure in order to gain the more remote good. If courage is the ability to say yes to right action, even in the teeth of pain, temperance is the ability to say no to wrong action, even in the jaws of pleasure. Uh, it's very different than abstinence, Lewis says. 
It's very different than abstinence because uh, anybody stubborn could be abstinent. But temperance says right amount, right place, right time. Lewis put it this way. He said, temperance referred to all pleasures, and it meant not abstaining, but going the right length and no further. It's a mark of maturity, I believe. I, I, I know you might think my children were born uh, mature, right? My children. But they weren't. I noticed when they were children, they would sell their souls for sweets. <laughs> I, I, I can remember one time Claudia was ill, and I told her I would make dinner. I'm, I'm really a bad cook, so that meant two cans of chunky chicken noodle soup in the microwave, you know. We had three kids at that time. Jeremy and Alicia were the oldest. Grady, our third born, we have four, but Jeff wasn't born yet. Grady was in a high chair. So I gave Jeremy a, a Papa Bear portion of uh, chunky chicken noodle soup. I gave Alicia a Mama Bear portion, and I gave Grady a Baby Bear portion in his little high chair. And I told the kids, listen, I'm going to take some of this up to your mom. When you're finished with your dinner, you can get a Popsicle and eat it on the front porch. So I go upstairs. I tell Claudia, everything's taken care of, you know. I got the kids covered. Here's a bowl of soup. Gave her a kiss on the cheek. Came down. I was upstairs at maximum a minute and a half. And while I'm coming downstairs, Jeremy and Alicia are running out the front door with their popsicle. And, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, of course, you know, I made such a good dinner. I get it. They just wolf that thing down. I go in the kitchen. Jeremy's bowl is clean. Alicia's bowl is clean. Grady's bowl just piled high with stuff. <laughs> Those little scoundrels just put it right in there, and I'm going, oh, my word, I got my work cut out for me. I'd come home from work, and every day when I'd come home, you know, they'd say, Daddy, did you bring me something? Did you bring me something? I always brought them something, you know, maybe a paper clip, <laughs> a doodle if I was talking on the phone. Sometimes I'd bring them that yellow butterscotch candy wrapped in cellophane, you know. They'd say, Daddy, Daddy, did you bring us something? And I'd say, yeah, I brought you this penny candy. And I decided one time to do an experiment with them. I said, I'll give you the penny candy now. Or, if you're willing, you could refuse it now and I'll take you to Toys R Us and buy you a toy tomorrow for $10. And that was back when $10 could still buy you something. They all took the penny candy. I had my work cut out for me. And finally, the day came when Jeremy said, I'll take that, pen, that, that toy. The other kids looked at him like he was crazy. They didn't even suck on the candy to make it last. They chomped it. They couldn't even suck on it temperately. <laughs> but eventually each one, each one took the toy. I remember years later, Alicia was telling us about some problem of somebody that happened in high school, some, one of her classmates that got caught up in some unfortunate behavior and the consequences that followed. <laughs> And she said to me, Dad, is this why you did the penny candy thing with us when we were little? That we would learn to be temperate in all these areas as well. And I think this kind of character, it doesn't come easy to us. If you want to be temperate, it's going to take some courage too. These things are all interwoven. And, and the next area is, is justice. And justice is basically the habit of being law-abiding and concerned for the general welfare of one's society. It seeks to be fair. It renders to others their due. Justice seeks to be uh, law-abiding and concerned for the general welfare of one society. It's fair. It renders to others their due. Um, Lewis says justice is the old name for everything we should now call fairness. It includes honesty, give and take, truthfulness, keeping promises, and all that side of life. You find these Comments by Lewis in Mere Christianity. Justice is that one feature of virtue that says my character and moral development is linked to my responsibility to others. Matter of fact, Lewis, some people think the greatest thing that he wrote was that sermon, The Weight of Glory. When he gets to the end of the sermon, remember how he says that there's no ordinary people. You've never met a mere mortal. Every person you meet, if you could see them as they would one day be, 
They would either be a, a, a horror the likes of which you see in your worst nightmares, or they would be a glory the likes of which you'd be tempted to fall down and worship. And he says, every one of us is causing people to move one way or the other. And the weight or burden of my neighbor's glory, this sense of justice, in other words, in evangelism, there's a character that should be developing me of justice to share my faith with other people. It's interesting, you look at Reflections on the Psalms by C.S. Lewis. He, he's so honest. I, I, I've heard sermon series on the Psalms. I, I don't know about you. I've, I've had people say to me, oh, yeah, I, I love the Psalms. They're so comforting. I go, really? I don't think you're reading the same ones I'm reading. Sometimes I think David's bipolar, you know. <laughs> when I've heard these series on the Psalms, every time I've heard them, I've never yet heard a sermon on Psalm 109. I pray, Lord, that all my enemies' children will be orphans. <laughs> I've never heard a sermon where they've included Psalm 137. Blessed are those who bash the Babylonians' babies' heads against the rocks. There's one for edification for you. <laughs> but you read what Lewis wrote in Reflections on the Psalms. This guy's so honest, he deals with them. And he talks about this. He says, I don't think God wants us to bash anybody's baby's heads against the rocks. But have you ever felt like you wanted to grab somebody and shake them? Is your faith in irrelevancy at that point? Or does this give you a template how to go to God with those deep-seated anger and press out the pus in the perfect relationship so you won't take it out on this other person? But Lewis said, if all Scripture is written for our edification, then we should consider this too about these psalms. That somebody did something to make that psalmist so upset. And we need to go and ask, have I ever done anything that would have hurt somebody to that degree? That we go back and set it right? It's a related passage to what Lewis had written about the weight of glory. We're either moving people towards the divine or the devilish. And this is important in our own recognition of what's going on in our own soul, in our own character, in our own development, is that we then engage with others. Evangelism as an act of justice. And lastly, wisdom. The definition of wisdom, it's the habit of being careful about decisions we make. It seeks counsel and advice. Lewis says, prudence, another word for wisdom, means practical common sense taking the trouble to think out what you are doing and what is likely to come of it. Wow, there's great advice for the evangelist. So let's see if we can take these things now that we've talked about. Character of the evangelist, the recognition of our own need, our willingness to incline ourselves to grace, to build something on that foundation as we develop uh, Christian habits of virtue, courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom. And how will that work out then as I start to share Christ with other people? In the first Peter, uh, second Peter uh, 1, 1 through 11 passage again, it says if these things are ours, they will allow us to develop uh, habits that are useful and fruitful for kingdom purposes and sharing the gospel. So let's look at one. I'll start to be more aware of others. Rather than being self-referential, I'll become self-aware and concerned for the welfare of others. So Here's something I've tried to do in light of what Lewis has written. If you're going to share the gospel with somebody, it seems to me you have complete freedom in sensitivity to that person to ask public questions. Um, these people matter. You can engage them in discussion. You're sitting on an airplane. You talk to somebody in public question. You're leaving Chicago to go someplace. Um, what's your name? Public question. Do you live in Chicago? If they say, no, I, I'm, I, I'm going home. Oh, where's home? You know, San Francisco, whatever the case might be. What brought you to Chicago? <coughs> Listen to the answer. And in the answer, you begin to get information that gives you the freedom to go deeper then because these people matter. And we're becoming less self-referential and more aware of the needs of others, and so on. I remember once I was in Chicago, and I met this guy. I said, what's your name? He said, Peter. 
I said, Peter, are you from Chicago? Public question. He's li- is, I'm meeting him in Chicago. He said, yeah, I live in Chicago, but I grew up in Albuquerque, and when my parents divorced when I was 12, I moved to Chicago with my mother. This guy was in his late 20s. He didn't have to tell me all that stuff, but he did. And he gave me the freedom then to ask him. I, I said, that was a long time ago, but it sounds pretty raw for you still. Tell me about that. And he started unpackaging his heart. I think he probably had thrown that stuff out. Who knows how many times? Nobody picked up on it. You know what I found out about Peter? It wasn't that he was so upset that his father abandoned the family when he was 12. But he was getting upset about what the bitterness and the rancor was doing to his own soul. And he didn't know how to break free and forgive his father. And now, I'm not just talking the gospel self-referentially as if the output is what matters. But where of this person I'm talking with, with the brokenness of our world and so on, I'm able to segue the gospel to the place of his felt need. And it's being heard. I'll give you another example similar to that one. I was speaking on C.S. Lewis in Bratislava, uh, Slovakia, during spring break a few years back. After I was done with the lectures I gave there, I was brought to the Vienna airport. It's only about 45 minutes from Bratislava. And I get checked in, and I go to the uh, gate. After I go through passport control, and I'm sitting there, I find out the plane's been delayed three hours. I love the anonymity of airports. I'm sitting there reading a book. And all of a sudden, I see a young woman come into the gate area, and she's got a lanyard and a, and a, a name tag, and she's got a clipboard, and she's going up to people. It's, Vienna's a German-speaking city. She's speaking them in flawless German. And she's getting things and writing them on her uh, on her clipboard, and I assume she's doing a survey for the airport. Sure enough, she comes up to me. She speaks in flawless English, and now I'm really insecure. What am I worrying that she knows not to speak to me in German? I said that to somebody one time. They said, well, you said you were reading a book, right? She probably saw his English, stupid. (laughs) So sure enough, she's taking a survey for the airport, and I said, what's your name? Public question. She said, Allegra. I said, Allegra, do you live in Vienna? She's in Vienna. Public question. Listen. She said, no, I'm from southern Austria. What brought you to Vienna? I'm a student. Now where can I go with the questioning? Where do you go to school? What are you studying? We started to talk about those things. She's studying anthropology. Then I I, I finally said to her, well, do you have any other family in, in southern Austria? I have a father, but he's a very toxic person and bitter Why is he so bitter? Well, my mother left him to go with her lover to Canada. And for good reason, too. He's a difficult person. Boy, that sounds sad. Your mom's gone. Your dad's difficult to live with. Do you have any other family? Yeah, I have a brother. Where's he? He's also at the University of Vienna, but we don't get along very well either. And it's worse than that. She's now giving me more information. And I'm saying, why, Allegra, is it worse than that? Well, my boyfriend went to study art in Florence and said he would be back in six months, and he wanted me to wait for him, and I dutifully waited for him, and he came back yesterday to tell me he met somebody better in Florence. And here's a woman who is brokenhearted, abandoned. It's not about proclaiming the gospel. It's proclaiming the gospel to a person in a context whose life matters because there are no ordinary people. So then I, I, I said to her, 20 minutes have gone on. I know her life story. She hasn't asked me a question yet. I said, Allegra, I know you've got to do your survey, but I've been sent here to tell you something. Then she thought I was a plan at the airport to see if she was doing her job, you know. <laughs> I said, no, it has nothing to do with that whatsoever. But you, I've, I've been sent to tell you something, and all of you have been sent to tell. When Jesus said, go, he, he didn't modify that since then. Might take courage, might take temperance, might take justice, might take wisdom. But he said, go. She asked me her questions. How long did it take me to check in, get through passport control and so on? And then she said to me, what were you sent here to tell me? I am speaking now to a woman who feels isolated, alone, unloved, and abandoned. I know what to tell her. I said, Allegra, the God of the universe knows you, and he loves you. I said again, Allegra, 
He loves you. Sometimes it takes three times to break through. And I said it a third time. Allegra, he loves you. She burst into loud sobs. Everybody in that gate area is looking at me as if I'm torturing this poor woman. <laughs> and she said to me, but I've done so many bad things with my life. I didn't even have to tell her about sin. I could shine the light of God's love on her. And all of a sudden she saw coming into that light where the shortcomings were. I said, oh, Allegra, he knows about everyone. And he forgives you of everyone. And able to share with her. Is that cool or what? I'll tell you another thing. Awareness of our own brokenness. Awareness of the character that needs to be emerging. It should also make us aware of human brokenness around us. And when we share the gospel, that also is helpful. Picking up on Lewis's style. So years ago, I, I, I think we should validate brokenness. Validate it. When it comes up in the conversation, let the person talk it out. So I, 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 my best friend lives in Santa Barbara. His name's Tim. And he and his family had a foreign exchange student come to their house. This was years ago. And she was with them for the whole year. She's from Germany. And during that year, she became a Christian. So her parents are coming from Germany to pick her up. They've rented a motor home. They're going to travel around the national parks for a month, and then they're going to go home. And my friend Tim's kind of nervous that if their daughter came to faith, they're going to wonder, did she join a cult or something like this? Would I come to dinner with them? I don't know what he expected me to do, but maybe he was just trying to get a buffer zone between him and the girl's father. But anyway, I sit down next to the girl's father at dinner. I said, where, where, where are you from in Germany? He said, Dresden. You guys know about the bombing of Dresden? It, it didn't need to be done. Germany was, uh, Berlin was almost surrounded. Now, I didn't live back then. If I'd have seen my buddy shot in war and destroyed and all that other stuff, maybe I'd have had a different attitude. I don't want to be too quick to judge those who called for the bombing. But nevertheless, we know from a historic perspective, it was unnecessary and it was wrong. And I looked at this man and I said, Dresden? And he said, Dresden. I said, has any American ever said to you the bombing of Dresden was wrong? Will you forgive us? And his eyes started to well up. He said, I wish my father was here to hear you say that. I said, is your father still living? He said, yeah. I said, would you tell him for me? He said, I will. And then he said to me, has any German ever told you that the invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939 was wrong? Will you forgive us? Our, our, our father came back from the war. He had post-traumatic stress disorder and OCD all of his life because parts of him were on the battlefields in the South Pacific where he was in two first wave D-Day invasions in the South Pacific and one second wave. And when this guy said this to me, my eyes filled with water. The whole conversation turned to human brokenness and man's need. And by the time that conversation was over, this guy was pleased. His daughter came to America and found faith. We were with the Yars over at Cantini, the big World War I museum over there. Just, uh, was it yesterday or the day before? Yesterday. Two days ago? Two days ago. We're walking through this World War I museum and all this horrible stuff, man's inhumanity to man. It's incredible. This is a broken world. There's context there for us to share the gospel. Lewis helps us understand that. And I'm walking through this thing and seeing all this horror, this, this record of such human horror. And I happen to be passing through this display with two black women. And when I got to the end, they're kind of talking, look, looking back at this thing. And I said, this stuff is horrible, isn't it? They said, yeah. So said, man's inhumanity to man is a horrible thing, isn't it? They said, yeah. I said, has any white guy ever said to you, he is utterly ashamed of what his progenitors did to your progenitors? They said, no, never. I said, well, I'm ashamed. 
Will you forgive us? I, I expected maybe tears, but they broke out in big smiles. Like maybe there's hope. Maybe somebody will come aware of these things. And they said, nobody's ever told us this is unique. I said, well, I'm sharing with you because I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, and I want to be aware of this brokenness, and I want to point people towards hope in Jesus. And they, they looked at me with an even bigger smile, said, we're Christians too. This is Lewisian, I think. Do I have time for one last story or we're done? It's we, we need, huh? One last story? Okay. The best explanation of what I've seen then in a fiction for Lewis is, uh, you all know it, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Once was a boy named Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. <laughs> Written by Clive Staples Lewis, who knew nobody deserved to be named Clive Staples. <laughs> Eustace has, it's your favorite Narnian book, right, Esther? Eustace has the heart of a dragon under the stretched skin of a little boy. And he ends up in Narnia with his cousins, the Pevensey children, um, uh, Edmund and Lucy. Lucy, the most spiritually sensitive of all the people from our world that go into Narnia. He has the heart of a dragon under the skin of a little boy, and in the magic of that world, though he protests his being there, though he constantly wants to go to the British consulate and get things settled... <laughs> They have a horrible shipwreck. They are in a terrible storm. Their mast goes off. They are in the storm for a long time. Ship needs to be revictualed. The water is low. Eustace is stealing food and water long beyond his rations. When the ship comes to shore, all hands on deck, we got to fix this ship. Eustace will have nothing to do with it. He goes walking off and he comes to a dragon's lair. He doesn't even know what the place is because Lewis says he never read the right kind of books. And all of a sudden, in the magic of that world, Eustace becomes externally what he's always been internally. He's sitting at that dragon lair. He puts a, a gold wristband on his arm. He looks down in the water, and he sees hovering over him a dragon. He's afraid. He's got to get out of there. He moves his left hand, and the dragon moves his left claw. He moves his right hand, and the dragon moves his right claw. And all of a sudden, his horror, much like Lewis on that bus in the discarded, I mean, in the great divorce, he looks in the pond and he sees reflected back the reality of who he is, that he is a dragon. Oh, he's so brokenhearted with the reality of his brokenness. The character can now begin to emerge. He makes his way back to Dawn Treader. They're all afraid when they see him. But awkwardly, he scratches into the sand that he's Eustace. And everybody comes running up and loves on him. And they're loving on him like they did even when he was so difficult. And he realizes that these people have been kind to him all along. Well, now in his dragon state, he could be useful to them. They need a mast. He just goes to a tree, knocks all the branches off with his dragon claw. With his dragon hot breath, he tempers the wood, sticks that thing up in the ship, and they've got a mast. He flies over the island, and he finds mountain goats and different things to revictual the ship. He finds where there's sweet water and sends them to go get the sweet water for the cistern on the ship. But now they have to leave the next day, and what are they going to do with Eustace? That next morning... In the gray dawn moments before day breaks, there's one member of the dawn treader who's up and about. As Eustace, the boy, comes back to the ship. And this one member becomes his father confessor. And Eustace shares that he'd gone back to the dragon lair. He said there was a lion that showed up. He said, I shouldn't have been afraid of him. I was way bigger than him as a dragon, but I was afraid. And he looked at me and he said, you've got to undress yourself. I said it dawned on him that dragons were scaly things like snakes and lizards. Maybe he could just shed his proper skin and be boy again. And so, ah, with tremendous effort, he shed his skin and saw he couldn't do it. It's like Lewis said in Mere Christianity. Nobody knows how hard it is to be good unless you've tried. And if you've tried, you see your own frustration. 
He looks in the pond, he still eats dragon. So, uh, second time he sheds his skin, looks in the pond, still eats dragon. A third time, frustrated, he looks at the lion as if his only hope could come from there. And the lion says, I must undress you. And he takes that dragon, that lion claw, and cuts through all that dragon flesh all the way to that dragon heart that needed to be transformed. And makes him boy again. Clothes him. And Eustace comes back to the ship. And who was it that was waiting to meet him in those gray dawn moments? Do you remember? Mary's got it. It was Edmund. Edmund. The one who had to have his own undragoning in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where Aslan had to give up his life to set him free. And now what happens to Edmund? Edmund becomes the father confessor to Eustace. He goes out on the evangelistic enterprise and receives him. By the way, we're not done with Eustace. He comes back in the silver chair. What for? This is Lewis's ecclesiology. You've got, you got his soteriology in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Right? You've got his eschatology in the last battle. You've got his ecclesiology in the silver chair. A motley crew of unlikely collaborators. Eustace and Jill and a marsh wiggle named Puddleglum are given an assignment to rescue the king's son who's been under a spell and doesn't know his own identity. And they have to go into that land and they muff every sign and they goof up and they're very incompetent, just like we are in the church. But they go to rescue the king's son and bring him back to his true identity. In their brokenness, they're missional. Let's pray. Father, thank you (coughs) for this evening. Help us to learn from Lewis's passion to share the gospel and help us because of him to do it better, we pray. For Christ's sake, amen.